Welcome to the Sharp 600, brought to you by Covers.com. I'm Rob Cressy, and I'm super excited to be jamming with you. Joining me on today's show to talk about their favorite Super Bowl props is a mixture of guests who have all appeared on the show previously. We've got Sean Lockhart, Brandon Dubray, and Andrew Cayley. And I wanted to do this format for a few reasons. First, one part of my sports betting process is acquiring information from a variety of sources that I trust. Does what they are saying match up with the opinions that I have? In this instance, I'm giving you three perspectives on top of my own. Next, I asked each of them about their mindset for betting props in the Super Bowl. The reason I did this is I want to help you in the way that you approach making a sports bet. The Super Bowl very much can be shiny object syndrome. There's over 500 different bets that you can make on the big game. However, I want to make sure that we always keep our due north the same, and that is being a successful long-term sports better, not just betting for one game. By hearing three different perspectives on mindset, you can hopefully take a nugget or two and apply it to your own mindset. Along these same lines, I genuinely had questions about how others are approaching prop betting. The reason for this is a lot of the information that's published out there says, I like a certain bet at a certain price. And maybe this is articles from a day or two ago, or even right now. Then you go and look at your sports book and you see that the bet is a few yards different than what they recommended. And the price is a little bit more than you also saw. This certainly happened to me. This had me step back and pause for a second. As much as I like a bet, do I really like it at minus 140 or minus 170? Is that being a smart sports better? As we speak, I'm recording this on Wednesday at 2.30 p.m. Eastern, and I am yet to place a single Super Bowl bet. The side doesn't really interest me, as right now the line is Chiefs minus one. I don't see a ton of value one way or another, even though I guess I would slightly lean 49ers on a 51-49 uh, percentage, I guess pun intended. Uh, I'm going to be more interested in the live betting market when it comes to the side. Uh, I have been having my mind on the over-under, but more specifically, the first half over-under. I know that the public is going to be coming in late on the over and because of this, I've been waiting on placing any action. On Tuesday, the first half over under was 27. And I was like, all right, I'm leaning under. I want to see if this bad boy will get up to 28. Fast forward to Wednesday, and that number actually went the other direction as the total for the game went down to 54 and a half or 54, depending on where you're at. And the first half total went down to 26 and a half. So for me, I'm going to be curious to see does this number get back up to 27 or 27 and a half? As I like it a lot more there. As you're watching the Super Bowl, I would love to see pictures or videos of how you are getting down. Are you doing casual betting or having house bets? Or are you doing squares polls? Bonus points if you actually win one of your squares polls. You can hit me up on Twitter, at Rob Cressy. I'm going to be getting down just like you're getting down. Will you be in Las Vegas or New Jersey for the big game on Super Bowl weekend? 2020 is covers 25th anniversary, and we're kicking off the year by hanging out at sports books in Las Vegas in Atlantic City for the big game. Join us at the books in the Lincoln, Las Vegas, and Bally's Wild Wild West in Atlantic City to meet the covers crew, to talk sports betting, and to score some great prizes. In Vegas, we're giving away a $1,000 bankroll for the big game. And in Atlantic City, we're giving away a VIP viewing area for the Super Bowl. Plus, we'll also have some other prizes and tons of free swag to give away. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to get more details on when we'll be at the link in Bally's that weekend. And joining me to give you insight into Super Bowl betting is Sean Lockhart, 
sports betting consultant. You can follow him on Twitter at the real Papa bear. Sean, great to have you back on the show. Thanks for having me. So what I want to jam about with you first is your mindset for Super Bowl prop betting. How are you approaching this? Prop betting is just like betting throughout the season. It's all a market. You buy low, you sell high. Props are the same way. They move. Generally, it's just the juice that moves. Maybe the number doesn't move. But a popular prop may be Mahomes passing yards over. Everyone's going to want to bet that. If you do like that, maybe wait until later, closer to game time, as that prop is just going to, that yardage is going to go up and up and up. If you do want to hit that under. But it's just like any other market. It moves. Usually it's just the juice and not the number. Are you more apt to take no or under as opposed to yes? Because from a value standpoint, listen, who's going up to their Super Bowl party and being like, listen to this, guys. I've got the under. I've got four no's. I'm expecting nothing to happen in this game. I do generally lean to no's or unders in these bets because everyone does like to bet the over. They want to see something happen. I am a contrarian better generally. I think that where there is some value. So you will find me on a lot of no's, which is it's not as fun, but it can be very profitable. So here's the challenge in this is the Kansas City Chiefs. So for the last two games, uh, from a statistical standpoint, you could hear why the under in the Chiefs games, Andy Reid at home, the Chiefs scored two plus less points per game. And then in the various narratives, and I was on the under two weeks ago. And then what happens? They score 51 freaking points against the Texans. You're like, ugh. And then the following week, you're like, well, there's no way they can do this again. What happens? Boom, the over hits again. So I think the biggest trepidation for most people is even with the contrarian mindset, I'm like you. I want to be on the nose, the unders. But, man, talk about get comfortable being uncomfortable with this Chiefs team. It's, it's going to be very hard to back that under come Super Bowl Sunday, especially with the weather. It's going to be beautiful. However, there is always value when the money goes one to one side. We always talk about I think it was the 80-20 rule, the 70-30 rule you always bring up. Books don't exist. They exist for a reason. They make money for a reason. And it's not for handing out uh, profits to all recreational bettors when they want to take some, the exciting bet or the over. But this might be a Super Bowl where there probably will be a lot of points. I don't think we're going to see like last year where that game is decided with maybe one touchdown. I think we're going to see some fireworks for sure on Sunday. And, and I can see that, but if there's one narrative, 49ers, good defense, Chiefs, improved defense, question mark. We're not really sure about this. Like if the 49ers are going to win this game, if you think that's the narrative, you have to imagine that their defense is going to one, get pressure on Patrick Mahomes like we saw against Green Bay. And that could cause more for this way, more of an under for Patrick Mahomes. All things considered, his unders are like 350 yards and two touchdowns. That's what I'm saying. Wait until game time. Those numbers are going to keep increasing as well. I, if you smash that number right before game time, then you're going to get the best of it. It will be contrarian. It's going to be painful to watch the game. But I think you'll get definitely a very good market value number if you wait till the game the, up until the game time tip. Do you tend to stay away from players like Mahomes in more on the Demarcus Robinsons of the world? Or sometimes you can be like a, a Kyle Juszczyk over under these players who aren't used as much. So their variability on half a catch, one and a half or 27 yards where boom, it's one play as opposed to the market on Mahomes is going to be like, boom, that dude's going to blow up. Do you have thoughts on that? I generally do focus on lesser known players. I don't really bet the props that are the, the Tom Brady's, the Patrick Mahomes, the Jimmy Garoppolo's, uh, the prop I actually got for you does it. It's, it's, it's going to be their starting running back is one of them. But I, I do focus on ways that I think the game is going to play out. And I do think there is value if you do see a game plan, the way they can use these lesser known players to attack the defense of the other team. I think there is some money to be made there because everyone's going to be betting on Mahomes props. I, it is a little bit more, unless you're taking the under, unless you're fading that, I think that's the only strategy you can really back in this, in this game coming up. So I want to make sure that we reiterate this because it's an important point. When thinking about how you're going to be betting your props, I think it's important for you to say, what is the narrative for how you believe this game is going to unfold? And then based on that, you're sort of pushing your chips to the table, correct? 
Correct. It's it's all about how you think the game is going to unfold. It definitely, if you're if you're backing the Niners, it would probably be good to take some of the Niner players over some of their props overs. Uh, I know a lot of guys get mixed up on both sides. It, it can be overwhelming. I mean, there are so so many props that the books are offering. It makes the game so much fun. But definitely try to align your props. It'll, the payout will be better if the, the the game plays out the way you want it to. The challenge I see in this is I don't have a lean on this game. The spread's one. So it's like both teams. Is it do the 49ers convert on third down? Do they get pressure on Mahomes? Do they limit the number of big plays? Number of big plays is two versus five. So the variability in this, I believe, is pretty extreme because, quite frankly, I don't feel an edge one way or another. It's a close – It's. I think the line should even be a pick I think the Chiefs are the more exciting team. People want to put money on the Chiefs. I think these teams are very equally aligned. It's going to be a phenomenal game come Sunday. But that's what I'm looking for. It's a one-point spread. What, what more can you ask for in the Super Bowl? So let's get to the props that you like, and I don't know what you're about to say. So give me the first one you like. So we just talked about the narrative of how you see the game – being played and I do see a very close game I think odds makers see it that way with the spread I mean you saw some picks you saw plus one it might have got up to one and a half but it's settled at one right now it's going to be a close game the prop I like the most and it's even odds as well is the game will be tied at one point during the game after it starts zero zero so it's a game being tied after zero zero I hope it comes maybe on the the, the Chiefs drive down score the Niners drive down score seven seven boom you're paid Field goal, field goal, boom, you're paid. Touchdown, field goal, touchdown, field goal. Hopefully you're paid. I like the game being tied at some point. It'd be even better maybe late in the game if it's tied. That would obviously from an entertaining standpoint. But there's a prop out there that it's even odds on both sides. It's not juice to either side, but that the game is tied at some point throughout the entire game other than it's starting 0-0. You know what I like about that prop? You can know about it right out of the gate. And at the same time, from the entire way standpoint, you know the other team, they're going for this. So, hey, they might need a two-point conversion to Mm -hmm. send it to overtime, things like that. So, really like that one. Do you have one more you can give us? Uh, So, I like Mostert. I like Mostert a lot in this game. I've been looking at his overs quite a bit, but they've they've been gashed up. I think they've got a lot of early money. One thing I do see some value on that hasn't got hit too well is his over receptions it's one and a half is the number gotta pay a little juice for that over which i don't mind doing because i do see a lot of value here but i think garoppolo will probably dump it off to him a couple of times throughout the game a safety valve he's also a big weapon out of the backfield to make me make a big catch maybe make a big score all he's got to do is catch two balls out of the backfield i think he's going to be the back that sees the most time he's gonna, he's, he can play all three downs if they need him to i love that over 1.5 prop I'm with you on the Mostert props, but the challenge I'm having is the juices you're seeing, minus 140s. I'm like, man, I do not like paying that for, and his numbers continue to go up. So do you have a threshold in which you're willing to take some odds, like um, will the game go to overtime? Some of them are multiples of like six or eight. So you're like, listen, I got it. I'm paying more in relation to that. But some of these player yardage props you're seeing, 125, 140, 170, and you're like, man, I do not feel good about paying that. So what's your threshold or mindset about that? I generally don't have a threshold. If I see a bet that a number that I think is wrong and there's minus 200 juice on it, I'll still lay it. There's value. Everyone thinks there's always value in just underdog plays or getting six to one on your money, but value comes with betting a favorite to betting, paying 200 to win 100. It's no different to me. And this number seems a little low. I wouldn't, if it gets up to two, I wouldn't get that. I, I do see him possibly getting three catches out of the backfield, but I love the number at one and a half. All he needs is two catches. I think that's very well in the Niners' game plan of attack against this Chiefs defense. I love – I think minus 130, minus 140 is what I'm seeing right now. I think that should be minus 200. I think that number pops up to two by game time. I don't mind it at all right now. Sean, I always enjoy jamming with you. Where can everybody connect with you? On Twitter, at da the real papa bear. Always down to interact. Any questions you got? I give out free plays all the time as well. Thanks for having me on, Rob. I always love talking Super Bowl and look forward to college hoops. And joining me to give you more insight into Super Bowl prop betting is Brandon Dubray, host of the Prop Shop podcast. You can follow him on Twitter at CoversBD. Brandon, great to have you back on the show. 
Thanks for having me, Rob. Excited for Super Bowl prop betting. Very much so. And what I want to know is your mindset for betting props. And this is something that I'm asking everyone who comes on the show because it's different from everyone. And props are something that are very easy to fall in love with. But I'm a little bit gun shy on it because uh, you're paying a little bit extra to play some of these. So what's your mindset going into playing props? Yeah, well, my mindset is, is really similar to if I was betting a side or even a total. Okay, so there's always a few things you have to look for. Number one is always look for the number. Okay, you can't just blindly bet over a passing yards for Patrick Mahomes because, you know, you think he's going to have a big day. Well, you know what, if you think he's going to have a big day, well, of course, the sports book also thinks he's going to have a big day. So that number is already going to reflect that. All right. Um, and the other thing you really have to look for, of course, when you're looking at the number is the juice. Very important in prop betting. Um, most props will be at about minus 120. So it's a little heavier on the juice already. Um, but as you said, they'll move it very quickly where they'll go to like a minus 140, minus 150 before they move off the actual number. So um, something I like to do is, uh, let's say I'm looking at a rushing yards total and it's at like the over, I want the over, but it's at minus 140. I'm probably just gonna wait. Um, hopefully you can wait a couple days uh, maybe that yardage total ticks up by one or two yards, but you get the juice um, back down. So um, that's one thing I'm looking for. The other big thing I'm doing is I'm really just considering a game plan and uh, doing a deep dive, uh, looking at some other football writers and how they think this game is going to play out. And then I think you can really find some, uh, some, some solid value in the numbers by just kind of envisioning um, how the game will play out on the field. One of the biggest challenges I see, though, and I agree with everything that you're saying, is even if we just look at Mahomes passing or Garoppolo passing or any of these rushing and receiving numbers, we're not accustomed to being like, oh, every week uh, Damian Williams is going to rush for 50 and a half or more yards like we are with minus three, minus seven, uh, 45, 50 over-unders like that, where it's more common in our lexicon. So it's kind of hard for me or the casual better to compare one yardage number or another, even though we may like Damian Williams in general, but we can't really tell if 50 and a half or 60 and a half or 40 and a half is value or not. Yeah. So my answer there would be, it just kind of goes into doing your deep dive in the game plan. Look at the defense, look what they give up kind of per average. Um, look at similar defenses and what, for example, Kansas City would have done against a similar defense maybe earlier in the year. How many times did they run the ball that game? Uh, how many times did they pass the ball? That kind of thing. So you really want to deep dive into the game plan. Um, and then you can maybe start to see and kind of envision how maybe, you know, not saying that we can all think like Andy Reid, but you can start to get an idea of how Andy Reid's going to want to run his offense that day. That should help you kind of decide on whether – you know, 50.5 uh, in Damian Williams' case, which I think is his exact line for this weekend, it is kind of an accurate number. Or if you think like, ah, oh, no, I think that number should be more like 55, 57, where you might want to take the over. All right, so let's now get into some of the props that you like. And I don't know what you're about to say, so I will let you take the stage. Sounds good. So uh, if you listen to Prop Shop last week, uh, there was an episode live. We kind of did our first Super Bowl rundown. Um, I gave out uh, Raheem Mostert to go over 60.5 rushing yards. That was the number I got it at when it opened at Bet365. Now, that number, uh, specifically at Bet365, is already up to 71.5. So I'm not going to sit here and give you a number you can't bet. Um, I've actually seen this number as high as 80.5 in some shops, which just goes to show, you know, uh, one more kind of learning lesson, if you will, is if you're betting props, shop around and get a lot of different outs because these numbers can vary. They can be all over the place. But back to the bet, um, another way I'm going to play this is by taking uh, the over on Mostert's longest run, uh, which is set at 16 and a half yards. So um, a lot of the same analysis applies here. Uh, and the same analysis that I gave kind of on the prop shot when I bet Mostert. And that is that Kansas City has a very, very weak run defense. And it's actually statistically extremely similar to Green Bay's, <clears throat> which, of course, um, Mostert had a monster game against them uh, two weeks back there in the NFC title game. So we know that Mostert is going to be heavily involved on Sunday, or at least San Fran uh, wants him to be. They'll try to get the run game going early 
And if it's successful, one thing we know with Kyle Shanahan, he'll just keep going. He'll run it 10 times, 12 times in a row if he's picking up chunk yards, which he has been able to do with Mostert so far in the uh, postseason. Now, of course, I don't think Mostert's going to get those 29 attempts like he got in the NFC title game. But if he gets his 15 or 17, I think there's a very good chance he breaks a big run. Now, additionally, he's, he's just always a threat to break off a big run. Um, he, he's getting a lot of attention this week, obviously. But one thing you might not know about him is that he's incredibly fast. And in fact, if we look at the top speeds, um, you know, that you can find at NFL Next Gen Stats, he actually has the fastest play in the entire playoffs so far. And that's considering that's anything, not just running back. So that's anything from Tyree Hill, from Nicole Hardman, from DK Metcalf. Um, that run, his 36-yard touchdown run um, against Green Bay was clocked at 21.87 miles an hour. So that's ridiculously fast. Um, he's already topped 16 and a half as his longest run in eight different games this season. And I think he does it again on Sunday. So that's, once again, that'll be over 16.5 for Raheem Mostert's longest run of the day. I really like the thought process for this because, like you said, we're starting to see his yardage totals get so high that all of a sudden the value for me isn't quite there. Do you feel any different about this bet if, once again, this ticks up a little bit? What if that number gets 18 and a half, 19 and a half, which is the most logical thing because you're seeing so much of the most or props going over because San Francisco plus run plus Chiefs defense equals let me start putting action on the overs. Yeah, well, of course, you're always going to have to dial it back a bit if it does tick up. Now, I do like 16 and a half, 17 and a half, sure. But, you know, if, if you're getting up closer to 20, uh, you might want to kind of shy away from this one. All right. So do you have another prop bet for us? Absolutely. Uh, a little bit of a, a higher payout on this one. And this is going to be for George Kittle to have a rushing attempt, which clocks in at plus 380. Um, so I was kind of going through a huge list of props, and this one jumped out at me especially with the plus money here. Um, not a ton of analysis around this one, but anyone who has followed the Niners closely this year knows that Shanahan is not afraid to use Kittle on a jet sweep from time to time. In fact, it actually happened five times on the season. Um, and when I went back and looked at the game log of when he did this, I found it really interesting that um, three of these five attempts came from what were labeled at the time to be kind of the biggest games of the year for the 49ers. So the first one came on Monday Night Football in October against Cleveland when everyone was kind of saying, all right, you know, there was still all that hype around the Browns and everyone was asking if San Francisco was kind of for real. Another one came on uh, in early December, I think it was December 1st, when San Francisco played against Baltimore, which of course was the showdown with Lamar Jackson uh, and the two best teams in the league at the time. And uh, another, the third one, uh, the third of five, I should say, came in the final regular season game against Seattle in what was a must win uh, to earn home field advantage kind of throughout the playoffs. So, um, you know, for what it's worth, those two other ones came in that, um, that rain soaked game against Washington. Um, so I, San Francisco ran the ball like 40 times in that game. So kind of no surprise that that kid will actually got a carry there, but it, it kind of jumped out to me that, wow, these were three kind of marquee high profile games and Kyle Shanahan got kill involved um, in the run game. So, you know, he hasn't been involved in the offense so far uh, in the playoffs as far as catching and running the ball. You know, blocking has been a monster. Um, but I think that's going to change on Sunday. He's their offensive MVP. And Shanahan's had two weeks to kind of come up with a few different creative uh, schemes to get him more involved. So I wouldn't be surprised to see him getting a rushing attempt. And I just love the value, which is, again, at plus 380. I love the mindset around this. And one little nugget out there is, all right, if we know that the 49ers are going to be running the ball, let's start to look and see who else might be able to get a Russian carry. For example, Debo Samuel, maybe his is an over under half. Will he get one? So these jet sweeps, the ways to get these fast receivers or playmakers, the ball in open space there. So maybe that's one way to try and get a little extra action that might be under the radar on some of these 49ers players. Absolutely. And the case you brought up, Debo Samuel, I think his rushing total is actually set as high as like 18 and a half. So oddsmakers might actually be thinking he gets uh, more than one carry. 
Brandon, you are definitely someone that I follow a ton when it comes to the prop betting action between now and Super Bowl. You're definitely going to want to continue to follow Brandon. Where can everybody connect with you? Yeah, so on Twitter at Covers uh, BD. And of course, the Prop Shop podcast. We will have our final uh, episode of the football season anyway, uh, released uh, first thing Friday morning. So make sure you subscribe to that wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, myself, Andrew Cayley and Ro Panea will have a bunch of uh, a bunch of bunch of additional plays, of course, in addition to what we gave you already last week. And to give you even more insight into Super Bowl prop betting, joining me is Andrew Cayley, senior publishing editor at Covers.com and co-host of the Prop Shop podcast. You can follow him on Twitter at Covers underscore Cayley, and that is with a C. And great to have you back on the show. I'm excited to be back. Thanks for having me. So what I want to start with is talking about your mindset for betting props, but more specifically units. What are okay. you doing in terms of not necessarily the, qua the amount of dollars, but how are you managing your bankroll regarding props? Because now we've got a bajillion of them. It's the biggest <laughs> game. It's the only game. So it's really simple to get loose with all of your action, but I don't believe that you're going to be one of those people. No, well, you've got to approach it just like you would any other bet sort of thing. It's, it's just like any other, any other bet you're making. You don't want to be, be going into the Super Bowl and coming out like, I need to win this bet for me to have a good Super Bowl. And I, I will just be having, it's just a larger, on a larger scale. I'll probably obviously be making more wagers during the Super Bowl than I would during a regular NFL football game. But that said, I'm still only sticking to my, like, I only usually do one unit on a play, and I'll stick to one unit on a play. Um, and I won't be chasing losses in the second half sort of thing. That's what a lot of people do. You, you, a lot of people make a lot of first half bets for the Super Bowl. And then you're at halftime, you're like, oh, dang, I'm down however many units already. Let's go chasing in the second half with some more live wagers. And that isn't always the sound of strategy. So when looking at it, are you going to have 20 plus bets? Because even if we're going to look at units from a bankroll management standpoint, there's only a finite amount that you can have. Because for me, I bet on average between one and 5% maximum on any one bet. And yep. looking at the props for me, I'm probably going to be chopping mine into half unit bets because this is only one game. And I'm not about yep. to be like, by the way, I've got 17 units on the Super Bowl. Like, wait a second, I get it's the last game but you don't want to kill your bankroll. Yeah, just like just like the teams that are in the Super Bowl, do what got you here. If you have a sound betting strategy like you like apparently you do the 1 in 5%, that's a basic unit for most people, and I think that's a smart a smart thing to do. Stick with what got you here. Keep the units small. Don't and even even go a little smaller if you have to since you're going to be making more bets. And yeah, uh, have fun with it. Don't don't a lot of these props are there so we can have more fun with it, but don't get lost in the sea of props and just be betting for the sake of betting. And don't get all macho with your bets. You're like, oh, I'm just going to start putting $500 or $1,000 on all of those because I'm just a big man better, which you're going to see. I see it all the time that people will flex how much they're putting on these things, but that doesn't impress me. That actually is the complete opposite for me. It recklessness is yeah. stupidity. That that said, like since there are so many props, like there is value to be found. Like it's just like college, early season college basketball. There's just too many lines and too many things for the books to keep that close eye on. And and the thing is, with all of these now legal markets, now everyone's competing with everyone else to have more and better prop bets, and they probably aren't watching those lines as closely as say just the regular line in total for the Super Bowl. So there's definitely value to be found there if you're willing to put some time and research into it. So there um, just don't go wildly betting every single prop. Like you said, I would love to see a meta prop bet that says how many prop bets will you lose? <laughs> Not that they could do that, but if you could bet on, because oh, let, over let's under assume, numbers, <laughs> right? Let's assume that we're all taking bets between minus two hundred, something along those lines. We're going to keep them nice and simple because we may <laughs> think these things are going to happen, but then last year's Super Bowl happens and nothing wins, and you're like, exactly. Uh. So let's get to some of the props 
that you like and you wanted to talk about the MVP props first. Yeah, MVPs uh, is a big one. Last year, uh, I, I've wrote an article on it the last three years and last year I hit pretty big on Julian Edelman. He was my big kind of long shot to go in on. Uh, guys outside of, obviously the favorites are Mahomes and Garoppolo because they're the quarterbacks of the teams and quarterbacks win, <laughs> win the MVP a lot. Um, but this year I went a little different in a di little different place for the Niners. <sighs> the, a lot of people can win the MVP on the Niners this year, I think, that isn't Garoppolo. Like they could win a game with him throwing only 12 passes and he's probably not going to win MVP in that case. But Mostert's value is a little less. And an MVP hasn't won since Terrell Davis did back in Super Bowl 33, 98, when the year, the year they beat the Packers. That was crushing to me as a young Packers fan at that point. Um, but a lot, 22 Super Bowls now without a running back winner. So you look somewhere else, and that to me is George Kittle. He is the best pass catching option the, the Niners have. Um, and he, while. He hasn't had a big playoffs. He still was their best um, target in the passing game all season long. And there's also going to be this thing, if he grabs a touchdown or two and has over 100 yards, but, uh, but more impressive about Kittle is if he's able to, like, land a big emphatic block on somebody and, like, the announcers are going to be talking about it because that's what everybody talks about with Kittle. Like, he's crazy. He's, he's kooky. He's a lot of fun to watch. And he's going to have everybody talking about it. And since it's a media vo uh, based vote for the MVP, that's the type of thing that can impact a voter. Like something that has a tangible effect on you can really have an impact. So at like 15 to one, whatever he is now, I think he's pretty good value. Uh, another guy I like for the Niners is if the Niners win, they're going to have uh, other defense is probably going to play a very large part of it, obviously. And you could pick a guy like Bosa, but all those, any one of those guys on that line could have two sacks. It doesn't it, it just depends on who the chiefs bat, uh, block and, who, who has the big game? Any one of those guys can have a big game. And so I'm looking at the secondary and a guy like Richard Sherman, who has two picks this postseason. He would need a pick and a couple of other impact plays. Obviously, we would never hear the end of it if he won Super Bowl MVP. But at 5,001, I think he's, he's tremendous value there. Um, sorry, go Chiefs, ahead. On the Chiefs side of things, it's hard for anyone other than Mahomes to be the oh, he's going to win the MVP, but there's also yeah. why there's odds. So if you had to say someone other than Mahomes, who would make the most sense in terms of a Chiefs MVP? That, that, that's, a really, like, that's a really good point. Because uh, I, I, that's the mindset I tried to get in this year. Like, who's the Edelman guy this year? Who is Edelman? Who's that guy who can win it? It can't be anyone. It, like, it's definitely not going to be Kelsey or Hill. Like, if those two guys are having big games, Mahomes is just having a bigger game but he's obviously going to win the award. So you got to look somewhere else. You have to expect, you kind of have to hope that the game's a little lower scoring and maybe Mahomes only throws two touchdown passes, but they get a, a return for a touchdown from Nicole Hartman. That's the, you need, you, that's the guy you're looking at. And, and I've seen him anywhere from plus uh, 4,000 to plus 9,000 sort of thing. So find the best number you can on him. If that's the long shot for the, I think he's the long shot for the Chiefs. You need him to return a kick at some point, a punt or a touchdown. He's an elite returner, like just awesome. And if he catches one of those bombs from Mahomes, then, and he has two touchdowns, I think that's some, some good value there. It has to, obviously, like I said, it has to be a lower scoring game, but you can see that happening if you consider the fact that the Niners will probably be busy trying to contain guys like Kelsey and Hill and, and so on. And now let's get to the tight end side of things. You had a tight end prop that you wanted to share with us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My two favorite, uh, actually, I'm, I'm doubling up here really quick on both Kittle and Kelsey. Uh, their longest receptions of the game. I'm going over for both of them. Uh, it's 22 and a half yards for Kittle and 20 and a half yards for Kel Kelsey. Obviously, these guys are both huge big play threats. They led their teams in 20 plus yards receptions. Kittle had 16 in the regular season, obviously not so many in the postseason. Uh, Kelsey had 13 in the regular season, but added four more in the playoffs. And I just think in a game that's going to be closer than uh, than what the Niners have previously experienced, they're going to have to throw the ball more in this game than they have the last two. And like I said, he's their best pass catcher. And he has a great matchup here. The Chiefs defense has been better down the stretch, but they still have some holes and they really struggle against the run. And what I think that will help is they run it, they run it, they run it, and then they'll hit Kittle in a big play action play. And that's where I think you get that 
22 and a half over on a play like that. And Kelsey's number was just the number that stood out to me more than anything on the board so far. 20 and a half. Like I said, 17 catches of over 20 and a half yards this season. I just the, – the Niners have good numbers against tight ends, but they haven't play, played any – any of the top tight ends this year. So you can't really take any of that into account. Their defense is tremendous. I will give them that. But uh, the Chiefs just seem like that offense where that doesn't matter. Mahomes is so good. Kelsey's so good. Hill's that they can – it doesn't matter how good your defense is. They're, they're going to be able to attack you. And I just love that number. I think that he'll be able to get that for you this, this in the big game. What are your thoughts on longest reception over number of receptions over number of yards? Is, is there more value in one over another? Because it's, it's very chalky to be like, I love Travis Kelsey and I love George Kittle because it's the most logical thing that we would say. So if we wanted to evaluate this properly, does it make sense to say, listen, there might be a little bit more value in taking their longest – uh, reception as opposed to some of these more volume based. Yeah, that's and that's why that's why I jumped on this as opposed to the the receptions. I think they're both at about five and a half receptions. Um, I'm not sure on the yardage. I think it's sixty nine and a half ish for for Kittle, and which is a pretty low number considering it, if he had a two big playoff games, you would expect it to be more in the eighty eighty kind of range, which I think uh, is where high seventies where where Kelsey is, but. For this play, you only need one play to hit these balls, like one play, and that's kind of what I'm thinking. Like, yeah, the Niners have a good defense, so maybe Kelsey doesn't have a good game, but I can still see him having having a big recep- having a big reception. Same with Kittle. Like, yeah, maybe he only gets four receptions in this game, but if they hit one big play action to him, then you've cashed that bet all, all day. He's hit that bet early, so I like that. Andrew, I love Javen with you. Where can everybody connect with you? You can connect with me on Twitter at covers underscore Kaylee. And obviously you can find all of my work on the website at covers.com. We've got a ton of Super Bowl content right now. And you can check out our covers teams in Las Vegas and Atlantic City for the Super Bowl. I love jamming with all of those guests. And now I want to jam with you. I want to hear from you. What Super Bowl prop action are you going to have? You can hit me up on Twitter at Rob Cressy. And make sure to use hashtag Sharp600 and be part of our community. And also make sure to tag at covers. And throughout this entire football season, I have loved the ratings and reviews you've given us on iTunes. When you show us love, we will show you love back. And I got to give a major shout out to my man, Z Keller 611, who gave us five stars. And his title said, best betting show out there. And now he says, Rob puts out the best betting show out there. I was a fan of Joe before this at times, but Rob has been incredible. Yes, his his picks tend to be very solid, but it's everything else he does that sets him apart. He makes you a smarter, better who understands the industry overall. He challenges your way of thinking and he opens up your horizons. Love the listens and couldn't thank him enough. Z Keller 611 I could not thank you enough. Thank you so much for your kind words and for listening and for being part of our community. Your feedback means the world to me. Remember, if you want to be a sharp, don't be a square with your bankroll. Be disciplined with your money management.